Hello, welcome to P.L. Wooden Exposed. That is Bishop P.L. Wooden Exposed. I am glad to be able to speak to you today from the vestibule of the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. By the way, right off of my left shoulder here uh, is a picture of the founder of the Upper Room Church of God in Christ, my pastor, the late, great James Henry Turner, who came to this city, the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, in 1980, following God's voice and started the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. Yours truly was appointed in 87, and the Lord has blessed us uh, ever since, and we thank God for His goodness, thank God for His kindness, and thank God for His tender mercy. My friends, I want to speak to you about something that's near and dear to my heart. We did a, a setting not long ago entitled, I Am Church of God in Christ. We addressed those who seem to uh, earn their living, if you will, criticizing all things Koji. And I would say that to criticize uh, a church, uh, a, a denomination such as ours, and to, uh, and to only mention the negative things uh, is to demonize the organization, especially when there are positive things that also can be talked about. Um, but at the same time, those who criticize the church, I am not saying that much of the criticism is not earned or legitimate, but I just believe that we have a great church and I love the Church of God in Christ. God has used the Church of God in Christ as a vehicle uh, to, to, to win me to the Lord. It was a Kojic preacher who preached me out of my sins. I, I learned about Jesus Christ in this church. The style of worship, the way we have services, uh, caused me to fall in love with the Lord. And I, I just bought it, my friends. I bought the whole thing, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, the convocations, the workers meetings, the district meetings, uh, the, the, the Friday night uh, uh, pastoral nights. Well, some of us now have Thursday nights, uh, the Tuesday night platform services, you name it. If it's a church of God in Christ, I, I bought it and, and I love the church. I've had some bumps and some bruises. I've been encouraged and discouraged, but I tell you, I'm glad to be a part of this great church. One of my lasting memories of the church is the first time I had the opportunity to go to Memphis to see the National Church uh, doing the convocation. And I had heard many things, both good and bad, about what I was going to see. And the truth is, what I saw actually <clears throat> changed my life. I went there and I didn't know anybody. I didn't know, <laughs> I tell you, it was some experience. Uh, I didn't know anyone. Uh, uh, I, I didn't know how to make any connections. I'm, I'm at the convocation and I'm looking and, uh, and I was there. But I tell you what blessed me. I had never seen a, a collection of prosperous African Americans like I saw at the convocation. Now I had heard that it's a beauty contest and people are trying to outdress one another and all that. Well, I didn't see any of that. I just saw black people looking good and loving the Lord. Some of the general board bishops now were young boys at the time when I was there. I remember seeing uh, Bishop, uh, general board bishop Drew Shears, general board bishop Brandon Porter, as they were young men in the church. And uh, it was an amazing thing to see, to see uh, African Americans uh, driving in, in the nice cars. And at the time, I didn't know that most of those cars were probably rented, but it was just a beautiful thing to see. It had a positive effect on me. And my friends, I'll never forget the first time I saw a then presiding bishop, Bishop J.O. Patterson, drive up. I, all I knew was when this car pulled up, this had to be the top man because of the way everybody began to move and to scramble and to, to get into place to receive the person who was pulling up. And uh, I thought to myself, I said, well, maybe this is the top man and maybe perhaps uh, this is the head guy in charge and maybe this guy, uh, he, maybe he's white because I've never seen that kind of response toward anyone African-American. And lo and behold, a black man stepped out. The presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ, presiding Bishop J. O. Patterson. And I tell you, my friends, what I saw changed my life. And uh, it, has, uh, it has still had a lasting effect on me 
uh, to this day. And I love this church. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons, one of the things that motivates me to do this is our love of the church. And this is why, my friends, I believe with all of my heart that our great church has got to deal with the fornication, the immorality, the homosexuality, the lesbianism, the presence of the queens, the presence of wickedness that, that is uh, in our church. I do not believe that we can afford to allow wickedness to destroy this church, unchecked wickedness. I believe from the, from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, it's time for our church to make a stand as never before. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 dealt with uh, almost legendary immorality that was taking place at the church at Corinth. He said in verse 1, it is, it, is, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, such fornication as is not so much or not as much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. The phrase here, should have, literally means to be married to. If you look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 29, you see that to have literally means in the New Testament to be married to. There was a man in the church at Corinth who married his stepmother. Paul was stunned at that example of immorality that was going on in the church. As a matter of fact, my friends, two things shocked him. The deed itself and the church's response or lack thereof, a lack of response to the wicked deed. He said, there's a man who it is reported to me, Paul hadn't met him, uh, he says, but it is reported to me there's a man in church who's married to his stepmother. And it is also reported to me that there's no outrage. There's no righteous indignation. There's no, uh, no one's upset. He said, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that have done this deed might be taken away from you. He says, you are arrogant. You, you, you feel that it shows the bigness of your church to uh, show this diversity or this tolerance in having this man in your church married to his step, his father's wife, married to his stepmother, and, uh, and none of you have said a word about it. You know, one of the mottos of the church at Corinth, it was all things are lawful. But Paul added, all things may be lawful, but they're not expedient. Well, my friends, this deed was not even lawful. It was wrong in every, every way. Uh, the Old Testament condemns it. The New Testament condemns it. And yet the, the liberals at Corinth were not uh, 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 astonished. They were not appalled. They, were, uh, they, they, they behaved as though it was all right. In fact, he says, you're arrogant. You are puffed up. You are proud that you have such a large tent in your church. And, you, and, and one of the things that concerns me about our church, our great church, whom I'm proud to be a part of, is that there seems to be an arrogance. There is certainly a lack of righteous indignation in many circles, and yet many of our great members are sick and tired of the growing presence of immorality in general in our church and this growing presence of homosexuality and lesbianism in our church and the, the seeming charade that takes place in the church where everybody seems to, well, let me rephrase this, not everybody, but too many pretend not to notice. Whether they're singing in our choirs, whether they're preaching in our pulpits, whether they're up having words, whether they're directing the choir or playing on the instruments or writing our songs, we tend to go along with the charade and we overlook this wickedness. Well, my friends, the Apostle Paul did not overlook wickedness. He dealt with it. 
He said to the church, you should actually be in the morning like you were at a funeral. That's what he describes here in verse 2 of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, you should mourn, rather you should mourn that he that have done this deed might be taken away from you. The, what he, the metaphor is to a, a funeral, to someone being taken out and, and buried. He says, for verily, as absent in, in body, but present in spirit, I have judged already. He uses the word judge. You know, we've demonized the word judge. We've taken Matthew's gospel, chapter 7, and turned it on its head, where the Lord says, judge not, lest you be judged. And so what we do is, we just teach that the Bible says, judge not. Well, that's not exactly what the Bible says. It says, judge not, lest you you be judged. And to be perfectly honest with you, my friends, to judge literally means to come to a conclusion about a person without knowing the facts. And I've said this many times. If a person robs a bank and they come up to me and they say to me, uh, brother preacher, brother bishop, I've just robbed a bank. And then if I say to them, wow, you are a bank robber. Well, they can't look at me and say, how dare you judge me? I mean, you just robbed a bank. Well, you know what you call bank robbers? You call them, uh, uh, pe you know what you call people who rob the bank? You call them bank robbers. I haven't judged you. I have rightly labeled you. I have called you what you are, what your actions suggest that you are. You are a criminal. You are a, a lawbreaker. You are a bank robber. Well, I'm not judging a homosexual to call them a homosexual. I'm not judging a lesbian to call them a lesbian and, uh, and to say that it is sin because the Bible says it's sin. The, when the Lord says judge not, the Lord was not saying that the church does no longer has the license to call that which is wrong, wrong, or to call that which is right, right. We must call, put a difference, according to the scripture, between holy and unholy, clean and unclean, and to call wrong behavior, wrong behavior, and right behavior, right behavior. For, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, uh, verse 1, judge not, comma, that you be not judged. We, we tend to believe that the Lord says judge not, period. No, it's judge not, comma, lest you be not judged, for with what judgment, uh, uh, with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. That is, if you're going to hold up the standard, just know that that same standard is going to be applied to you. I think that is true. I think that's correct. That if we're going to preach the gospel, then we should live the gospel. If we're going to preach the standard, we should live the gospel the standard. Now, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says, I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that have done this deed. You see, there are some deeds that are so dastardly that you can't leave it up to God and let the Lord fix it when the Lord gets ready. There are some things that those who are in uh, the positions of authority, those of us who have been appointed by God in positions of authority, we must deal with. The strength of a church is its ability to deal with sin. I know what it is to cleanse a church, my friends, from uh, 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 a homo the, 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 an invasion of homosexuals and lesbians. And one of the first things you have to do in, in order to, to cleanse the church, whether it's a local church, a jurisdictional function, national church or whatever, is you have to be intentional about it. Wickedness will not just go away on its own. Adulterers won't just stop committing adultery. Fornicators won't just simply stop uh, fornicating. Uh, liars won't just uh, simply stop lying. You have to be intentional about this and let people know that this kind of behavior will not be tolerated. You'll never, we'll never cleanse the choir as long as we put talent ahead of character. 
It doesn't matter to me how good you can sing. It doesn't matter to me if you have a voice like an angel. If your behavior, if your character is like a demon, then, then that person needs to be taken down, even if you don't have someone that you can replace them with who can sing as good. I'd rather hear a mediocre singer who is saved and loved the Lord and straight sing the praises of God to me than to hear uh, someone who has an angelic voice, but they're perverted and they don't love God. And they're trying to redefine Christianity so as to make you believe that you can be saved and be effeminate, saved and be a homosexual or a lesbian, saved and practice this wicked lifestyle and sing the praises of God and the church still be effective. No way, my friends. We have to be intentional about these deeds that are being done. Paul says, in the name of the Lord Jesus, when you come together again and also in my spirit. Don't gather as a mob. We're not to gather as vigilantes. We're not to gather to hang anybody. But we gather together in the name of the Lord. We come together as saints and we gather in the spirit of the leader. Paul says, come together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. You know what he was saying there? Put him out of the church. Take the individual down. Excommunicate them for the destruction of the body. That is, to deal with the yearnings of the flesh to deal with what's going on in him that would cause him to marry his, his stepmother, that would cause her to marry her stepson, that would cause an individual in the church to practice homosexuality, to practice lesbianism, for a man to, 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 to walk up carrying a purse. That person, they, that person should be allowed to come to the service. My friends, if they can't come to the service, there's, there's no hope that they can get saved. But to participate, to sing on our choirs, to preaching our pulpits, to usher on our floors, to be over our youth departments, to be over our children. Oh, my Lord, what's going on here? That individual, number one, should have never been appointed. But if they were, and once you discover them, you got to take them down. You can't take the approach, well, I'll just preach against the sin. I'll just cry loud and spare not, leave everybody in position, and hopefully they'll get right. No, you have to be intentional. Paul says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the body. Here's, here's what we're hoping, that their soul might be saved, that they would see the error of their ways and repent of their sins. My friends, the methods that we're using aren't working. Oh, just let them sing. Oh, don't judge anybody. Oh, don't bother anybody. Oh, don't say anything about it. Pretend not to notice. They'll eventually get right. It's not working. And on the occasion when it does, by the time the person does repent, they've turned out 50 boys or 60 young girls or 100 kids or, or whatever the case may be by the time they get right. And if, and, 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 and uh, I, I don't think that, that, that the, those numbers work as far as I'm concerned. I think that it's time for us to rise up and be intentional and tell everybody, listen, Jesus died for all. Everyone can be saved. But to serve in the church, to serve in the church, that should be a standard. To serve in the great church of God in Christ. We boast that our church is the greatest church in the world. Well, I'll tell you, great, greatest church in the world, we won't be the greatest church in the world. We will lose our greatness if we fail to do what the prophet Jeremiah said that we must do, what the apostle Paul uh, told the church to do. The, the prophet Jeremiah said that in chapter 4 and verse 3, he says, For thus saith the Lord uh, to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Break up the fallow ground. 
We've got to do something. We've got to say something or our church will be redefined uh, in, into being a church full of queens, full of practicing homosexuals, practicing uh, uh, lesbians. I'm not talking about people who've been saved and come out of their sin, but I'm talking about people who are practicing this stuff and turning other young people out, messing up lives. Our, our women are marrying young men who are on the down low. Uh, African-American women are getting AIDS faster than any group in the country, and they're not getting AIDS from uh, 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 women. They're getting AIDS from men who are secretly uh, slipping out on them, having sex with other men and we all ought to be ashamed and we all I, I want to know where is the righteous indignation where is the where is the rage where is the anger as our church is being redefined by immoral persons Paul said put him out deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the body that the soul might be saved he said to them your glorying is not good. You tolerating this stuff is not good. Your tolerance of this man being married to uh, his stepmother is not good. He says, put them out. No, do you not know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Do you not know to tolerate this stuff, these things, is to tolerate more and more and more and after after a while you just become a church we just become a church a holiness church in name only we're not going to let that happen we believe that from the top to the bottom and from the bottom to the top and all in between if the preachers and the teachers and the bishops and the superintendents and pastors, elders, missionaries, mothers, deacons, praise God, down to the person who's just washed in the blood and filled with the Holy Ghost, will cry aloud and spare not. Motivated by love, motivated by compassion, motivated by a desire to see people saved. If we would cry aloud and spare not, I believe that God would send revival to our church in this area. I believe that homosexuals and lesbians persons would get delivered. They would either get delivered or they would move on. But I want to say to you, pastor, I want to say to you, leader, I want to say to you, the church worker, I want to say to you, bishop, I want to say to you, uh, superintendent, I want to say to you, person whom God has put in uh, uh, a position of authority, be Man enough, be godly enough, be saved enough to obey the Bible. If that choir member, that elder, that deacon, that preacher, that leader, doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter who it is, if that individual is walking in immorality. And the immorality we're talking about is that when Paul says fornication, the word fornication there means any illegal, unlawful sexual activity, any sexual activity other than sexual act activity between a husband and his wife. This includes uh, homosexuality, lesbianism, bestiality, incest, you name it. Any sexual activity apart from the sexual activity between a husband and his wife. I pray that where we find this, if people do not repent, do not participate in the charade, take them down. And you, my, my brother pastor, who has a church full of uh, homosexuals, they sing on your choir, they, they serve in your church, you know, and you talk about the value and how they help you out. Just think of all the straight guys you could have in your church who won't visit your church and who won't join your church and who won't be a part of your church because of the presence of these other, these men and women because the average man don't want that to be mirrored to his son or daughter. I would not have my grandchildren. I would not have my son or my daughter 
in a church where the choir director is effeminate. Whether he's homosexual or not, if he's effeminate, I don't want that modeled to the young people. I don't want the, the, the tenor section uh, uh, filled with effeminate men, whether they're homosexual or not. If they are effeminate, I don't want the guys uh, uh, to look at men like that, young boys in their formative years, to look at men like that and think that that's all right. As far as I'm concerned, the, the one of the most beautiful things on earth is femininity. People say that when God took the rib out of Adam, he took um, all of the femininity out of him. I don't believe that for a minute. I don't believe that there was any femininity ever in Adam. The Bible didn't say that God took femininity out of Adam. The Bible says that God took a bone out of Adam, took a rib, a rib, and there was flesh on the bone. And he created a woman. And I believe that that is when God created femininity. I don't believe Adam was both uh, masculine and feminine. I mean, you're making the homosexual argument. If Adam, before God created Eve, was a he, she, was, was the first part of the day acting like a girl, and then the last part of the day acting like a man, then we're doomed. If that's the case, then the homosexual argument is, is valid. You mean to tell me you believe that when God created the first man, God made that man both masculine and feminine? Come on. No. When God made Adam, Adam was the ultimate alpha male. Gave him a job. Adam was made with a full vocabulary. Adam is the only person who created who never crawled before he walked. He never mumbled before he talked. Full vocabulary, able to walk upright, highly intelligent. I mean, every animal that he gave a name to, whatever, whatever Adam said the name of the thing uh, was, then God said, so it is. And then God did a marvelous work. He noticed uh, God says it's not good that the man should be alone. It's not good for God's plan. It's what, it was not good. It was good for God's plan. God wanted the planet populated and, uh, and wanted it, interestingly enough, replenished. That's another P.O. wouldn't expose for another day. He wanted it replenished. Well, uh, the man could not produce asexually. He needed a partner. And uh, homosexuals, in order for God's will to be done, God knew that he could not make as a help meet for Adam a male. And whoremongerer, God didn't make for Adam ten females. He made one female for one Adam. And he took, he didn't take effeminates, effeminacy out of Adam. He took a rib and he made a woman. And then God created uh, the most beautiful thing. He created femininity and put femininity in the woman. Masculinity he had already placed in the male. And when that masculine man saw that feminine woman and noticed that she was like him, different. He said, now this. We went, wow, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman. I heard one guy say one time, a woman is just a man with a womb. Well, brother, your wife may be a man with a womb. Patrick Wooden didn't marry a man with anything. I married a woman. <laughs> now, if you married a man with a womb, that's what you think of your wife. <laughs> she ought to slap you. Uh, but for, as, for, as for me, as far as the man is concerned, I married a woman. And Pam is no man with anything. She's a lovely, beautiful woman. And she's not... Um, Effeminate. She's feminine. 
Amen. Effeminate refers to a male who's acting like a, a female. But, but a woman is feminine. And God gave her femininity. God made her different. And uh, I don't have to go into what those differences are. And you know that. And, uh, and, and then the Lord blessed the couple and said, be fruitful and multiply. So back to my point that I'm making, if we as a church tolerate effeminacy in a male, singing the praises of God, praises of God in our church, directing our choirs, playing on the instruments, and my friends, it's getting worse and worse and worse than those of us who've been called by God and ordained by God to protect the church. God's going to get us for, for dereliction of duty. And let me remind you as I close this, we serve a God who, who blows church candlesticks out. I don't want God to blow the candlestick of the upper room church of God in Christ out. I'm going to do my part that the God of the Bible will keep our candlestick lit. For I fear God. I respect the Lord. I am not God. I'm just a man. I'm a human being. I have strengths and weaknesses. I get it right sometimes and I get it wrong. I'm counting on the blood of Jesus and the grace of God. Uh, I'm counting on the Holy Ghost. I'm counting on the name of Jesus to get me to glory. So therefore, I submit to the Lord and I submit to his rule. Church, let's obey God. I am Church of God in Christ. You've been watching P.L. Wooden Exposed. Think about it. We'll talk again. God bless.